Welcome to Stories of Sacrifice, American POW MIA's podcast, the voice of the missing in action and those that are buried as unknowns in our national cemetery. I'm your host and lead researcher, John Bear. Just a boy turning 17 Took me away from my home in Abilene I was sworn I'm a soldier now I was trained to survive And from a boy I became a man We journeyed to a place called Nan Spent 13 months of living in fear They say it's over, but I'm still here Hey America, can you hear me? Don't you remember me? Welcome everybody. We're doing part two tonight of our of the podcast we started last week with the MIA owner David McMillan from Australia. Hey everybody, how's it going? Oh, um, hey, bad. thanks, John Bear. I just want to say um I'm a MIA hunter. I'm not the MIA hunter. Other people have called me the MIA hunter, but there's a lot of MIA hunters out there that are a lot better and have been a lot more successful at it than me. So I want to send my love out to 
those people. Uh, I know a lot of those people are listening right now in Virginia, and some of them are listening from California. I want to <laughs> send my love out to Sparrowhawk Global in California too. There you go. And, uh, this week it's Veterans uh, Veterans Day this week in America, and we call it um, Memorial. No, what is it? Remembrance Day in Australia. So we had Remembrance Day this week, and all of the sisters and the brothers out there in the service in the US and in, and Australia. Uh, I want to send my love out there. Today we're going to be talking about the Cambodia incursion and the disappearance of Sean Flynn and Dana Stone. What's up, John Bear? Not much, yeah, and 10 other journalists. But, to, yeah, today we're going to focus Sean and Dana, and, and you're going to kind of lead us through kind of start to finish on events leading up to their MIA status and, and uh, where the – I guess witness statements or lack thereof have, have led the investigation to where their possible means remains might lie. Okay, no worries. So before in the old days, a lot of people believe that Sean and Dana were held in captivity for one year until they were killed in Kampong Chum, Cambodia in 1971. But uh, as you and I have been researching these facts recently, um, it's come to light that the people held in Kampong Chum in during that time held in detention by the communist Khmer Rouge forces that were executed in Kampong Chum in 1971 were uh, one of the individuals was Clyde McKay and the other individual was Ishinose Taizo, a Japanese citizen. They were both held at a prison in that area and they were executed within miles of each other at a um, the next village across. So uh, Sun Kei Kong village and Pakadong village. So for a long time, that led the investigation into exactly what happened to Sean in. It misdirected the investigation into a completely different area, which turned it more into myth. And everybody believed that Sean and Dana were held in um, detention for over a year or two years. And nobody believed that they could have... Um, fallen foul of banditry or they could have been killed or executed um fairly quickly after they went missing so and some of that was kind of due. some of that was kind of yeah. due to the, the intel by these analysts you know were mistaken mistaken sean and dana for two others uh you want to talk a little bit about that you know the, yeah the well was, yeah. Uh... yeah sorry john Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that the gentleman okay. that was hijacked the ship. Yeah. So there was Clyde McKay and he was the Columbia Eagle mutineer. He was the, the mastermind of the Columbia Eagle, which was an ammunition uh, vessel, a merchant vessel, which was taken over by this guy. And uh, he handed the ammunition vessel, U.S. ammunition vessel over to Sihanouk, the Cambodian forces. And it was just before the coup d'etat. And Lon Noll took over, and then this guy became like what one day he was a hero, and then the next day he became viewed as like a terrorist, and he was held in detention and uh, escaped and went into Kampong Chum and went missing. And nobody ever knew what happened to this American guy. And the thing is, is when he disappeared, he disappeared with this other deserter by the name of Larry Humphrey, who was a, a US Army deserter, very mysterious guy from, I believe he's from Ventura, California. And um, he was a linguist. He could speak Khmer and Thai, and uh, he has a very mysterious. He had a very mysterious background. But these two guys, they were into Charles Manson, and then they wanted to go over to the Khmer Rouge. So um, nobody knew what happened to them. So for a long time, it it was reported in the DIA documents that it could have been Flynn and Stone, or it could be McKay and um, Humphrey, but. Um, nobody really knew until the remains were recovered in um, San Kei Kong by the U.S. government back in, I believe it was the late 90s, and then until in 2010 when I recovered the uh, second missing individual in that area. So, yeah, the first individual um, pieces of the first individual had been found by bone traders and handed over to... A journalist and then those teeth were lost and then after that 
the American government went in and their dig teams found other remnants and bones at that location and they were able to make a positive ID so and work out that the person killed in Sankei Kong and Kampong Chum was Clyde McKay. And then nobody, everybody speculated that the person that was killed in Pakar Dong was Sean Flynn, including Jeffrey Myers, the author of Inherited Risk. In his book, the last chapter, it said that Sean Flynn was killed in Pakar Dong, Kampong Chum, in the book that was released in 2005. So essentially, I was following that information when I recovered the remains of Ishinose Taizo. So, um, at that time, we thought we had found Sean. And then in June 2010, we found out that we hadn't found Sean. So I had to go back to the drawing board and try to work out what happened to them. I was thinking, well, everybody's talking about and theorizing what happened to these guys two years after they went missing. But why haven't we had a look at the, why hasn't everybody concentrated on their point of capture and when they went missing the area where they went missing exactly. the last trace of them and, yeah uh, so uh, most people would uh, most people would know but some people listening don't know sean flynn was the son of errol flynn he was a famous movie stars um kid and he was a journalist he went over to uh vietnam and cambodia he did five years in Vietnam. He was very pro-America, um, and he was a movie star. He was very he was very well known in Asia. There was posters of his movies up, and they used to the Vietnamese used to call him Sin Flynn. They didn't know how to say his name, huh. and uh, <laughs> he was a really well known guy. And uh, I suppose uh, he took risks that other people didn't hadn't taken before, and uh, many people hadn't survived when they had taken and he seemed to be um somewhat bulletproof and one day he just went missing and it pro proved that he wasn't bulletproof but um sean went missing on the road in 1970 when he was on assignment in cambodia so they they started off in phnom penh and then they traveled to Sphay ring and they went missing in Sphay ring so they're at a press briefing in Sphay ring and so uh, Flynn and Dana Stone, they left the press briefing in Sphay Ring with the intention of investigating an impromptu roadblock that had been set up with a grey Peugeot car. And the grey Peugeot car had been shot up and it was blocking Highway 1. The grey Peugeot car, everybody at the press briefing understood to have belonged to a group of journalists that had went missing the day before. They told them. They told everybody that they were going to drive back from Sve Ring to Saigon, and they'd been ambushed. So, um, some of the people in the press briefing that day they jokingly remarked how much Sean Flynn and Dana Stone look like Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper, and uh, the characters out of the film Easy Rider. And uh, Flynn wittingly remarked, "No more like Queasy Rider." This is just before he went missing. One of the last things that he said. So, Rider, Flynn, yeah, <laughs> queasy rider. Yeah, so um, Flynn and Stone decided to travel with a mobile press delegation and head out to Highway 1, Chipu Village, Svay Ring, to observe the roadblock. The last piece of footage of Flynn was taken by a French documentary film crew. The film shows Flynn on his motorbike roughly 150 metres from where Claude Pont Arpin, Akira Kosaka, and uh, Akira Takagi had been captured. He has shown briefing the French journalist Christian Bosquiot on troop movements. Okay, so uh, at that time, Sean Flynn was dressed, and Sean and Dana were dressed in paramilitary style clothing. In addition to the paramilitary style clothing, he had a purple Kramer, an Australian bush hat, and he wasn't he was wearing flip-flops he wasn't wearing boots dana stone was wearing boots and he was dressed similarly with a australian bush hat and uh american camouflage uh, army pants and army boots so uh so lon Knoll's troops ranks uh no yeah long lon Knoll's tanks and troops that day closed to the position close to that position decided not to take the roadblock but to withdraw Bosquiat and the rest of the press delegation decided to follow the military out of there. And Flynn and Stone, concerned about the welfare of the journalist, 
and the car that had been shot up decided to take a closer look and they rode in the direction of the roadblock and they've never been seen again since that moment. So can you hear me, John? I got you. My cool, internet man. was wigging out there. Sorry. Okay. I, I, I texted you. Yeah. I don't know if you can bring that Okay. Up, yeah. I, I saw that. Great. Yeah. So that's a, that's the final, that's a, there's a, there's a, a final piece of footage of what happened there. So. Yeah. The so yeah. Um, video, pardon me. The last video of Sean being right before his capture. Yeah. The last, there's the last piece of footage. So um, I, I looked at what had happened. I wanted to find out what had happened. And um, some people had suggested to me that there was a high likelihood that Sean and Dana were killed early on and that they had it had been a possibility that they'd been killed as spies like or under suspicion of being spies yep. out in that area at that time. So... Um, yeah, I'm going to jump in there real quick. Yeah, there was a big, yeah. big thing going, controversial uh, thing going on at that time with the, the our, you know, the American government's the Central Intelligence Agency, the better known as the Three Lettered Agency CIA, was actually using a lot of journalists to do to conduct uh, spying operations for them, and so Sean and Dana kind of got up, caught up in that web with, uh, with with the Cambodian public thinking that they might have been spies so that's kind of a little background on that but there were actual journalists that were at the time yeah that's right because you know when we've had a look at the some of the documentation that you and i've looked at recently it has a very high level national security agency people and central intelligence agency people trying to work out what had happened to some of these particular people that went missing and uh yeah, revealing that some of the people that went missing with Sean and possibly Sean were military intelligence assets, U.S. military intelligence assets in Cambodia at that time, or they they've been reporting, they've been reporting what they could get to the embassy, the information that they could get about the Khmer communists to the embassy, and um, even if some of the journalists that were captured with Sean and Dana weren't doing that. I believe that the Khmer Rouge and um, the some of the Vietnamese communists that were operating in that area out there, they knew that these journalist guys had been conducting military intelligence spying operations on their positions out there. And yeah. uh, one one thing too is, is they also, you know, when, when some of these journalists were, were captured, they, the, well, it depends on who caught them, though. If it was the NVA or the VC or or who whoever whoever captured them, they're still that's still up in the air. But I kind of tend to go with your your thoughts on that, which I'm sure we'll get into. But uh, um, yeah, Sean's background. Uh, it was pretty well known that Sean was one of those guys that you know had embedded with the uh, special operations forces in Vietnam. At you know going into Laos, Cambodia, or other, or other areas, and he was actually on point with a rifle at times. So yeah, they well, kind of um, knew that. There's a plaque that um, I believe Rory has it. They were contacted out of nowhere about it, and um, it's a real U.S. Green Berets plaque that the that they made for Sean. The Green Berets um, consider Sean as an honorary member. So yeah, that's right, and um, I think you know, that this is the issue with what happened with Sean because in the areas where there was Southern Vietnamese military forces and there was US military forces, well, it was pretty easy for him to get out of anything because he was famous. But I think what, what happened technically with him and Dana, what they didn't realize, the way that it, what they were doing was being perceived by the Cambodian communists who were very territorial as Sean and Dana were trespassing and not taking their directions and deliberately trespassing on their territory. So uh, 
the way that they were dressed. And this is, there was a, there's a famous journalist who told me early on, he said he'd, he'd been in Africa and he knew about a lot about Sean and Dana and he knew horse fuss. And he said to me, David, never wear paramilitary clothes in the field because if you want bad things to happen to you, wear paramilitary clothes. Because my friend had been in Africa. He told me like a whole bunch of times he'd, be, he'd seen journalists shot up because they had paramilitary clothes on. Sean and Dana were out in that area on motorcycles. And at that time, motorcycles were the primary means of uh, movement for intelligence for the Khmer Rouge. They were using motorcycle couriers. So Sean and Dana were on motorcycles, which made them perceived to be even more as spies. So, um, and during that during that period, there'd been these operations happening called uh, Daniel Boone operations or Operation Salem House. So, since the early 1960s, the U.S. Special Forces had been carrying out secret reconnaissance and mine laying incursions into Cambodian territory. In 1967 and 1968, under Operation Salem House. About 800 such missions were mounted, usually by several American personnel and up to 10 local mercenaries, in most cases dressed as Viet Cong. So one Green Beret team inadvertently blew up a Cambodian civilian bus, causing heavy casualties. The codename of the operation was changed to Daniel Boone, and from early 1969, the number of these missions, uh, these secret missions, doubled. By the time of the coup d'etat against Sihanouk, on the 18th of March, 1970, over a thousand more of these operations have been conducted. Out of a total of 1,835 missions, 24 prisoners were taken and an unknown number of people were killed or wounded by the sanitized self-destruct anti-personnel mines laid by Daniel Boone teams up to 30 kilometers inside Cambodia. So... Um, I think the the security forces that captured Sean and Dana in Cambodia, they call them Santa Sok, which is um, like a security guard, like militia, local village level um, guy, reg- like village level guy, village level security guy. Right. And uh, they, they're the they're guys that captured Sean and Dana. And uh, when Sean and Dana were captured, as I said, both were wearing military style clothing and were traveling on a motorbike at that time these were the number one means of delivering intelligence the the sander sock easily could have surmised that uh sean and dana were daniel boone operatives so you know you could say that don't you, don't you think john yep do you agree with uh I pretty much agree with exactly with what you're saying there. And in, in so so once they were captured, what what happened yeah. next? Okay, so let's go there. So um I'm gonna read out this this statement. So part of this statement anyway. So this is this is from some local guys. Okay, so this is related to the capture of two American journalists on motorcycles in Sveiring province. Uh possibly correlating to Sean Flynn and Dana Stone. Okay, so in April 1970, two Americans on motorcycle were captured on National Highway 1 near Tolok Village in Sveiring Province, Cambodia. The two had cameras in their possession and were taken to an unknown location north of National Highway 1 through Prebarang Forest. Capture. Um, Capture of two American journalists on National Highway 1. On an unspecified day in April 1970, Mr. Mian, yes, pronounced Mian Yia, was walking in a wooded area north of National Highway 1 in Sveiring province. He observed Mr. Leng Sade, a Cambodian national who was forced into assisting the Vietnamese communist forces. He saw the two Viet Cong personnel telling Mr. Leng to stand at the south side of National Highway 1 and hold a cable tightly while they stood on the north side holding the other end of the cable. The objective was to trap and take prisoner unauthorized travelers on the road. At around noon, two American journalists on motorcycles coming from the west were ensnared in the trap. Mr. Min Yes pointed out the location of the trap and uh, 
After the two were trapped, the Americans' heads were wrapped in blankets. Their clothing was taken and later traded for alcohol. They were led away by the two Viet Cong officers and Mr. Leng, who took them northeast of Highway 1 towards Prey Barang. Mr. Min Yes did not know where they were taken. The group believed they were journalists because of the cameras they had in their possession. He admitted on, that he uh, only knew they were Americans through hearsay information while he saw Americans with his own eyes. He does not remember what they were wearing or what they look like because it was over 30 years ago. Mr. Ling participated in the capture of the two Americans and he later joined the Lon Nol forces and was killed in battle. So uh, it now it says so the former Vietnamese officers in Cambodia, they had um, information related to, there's some people who believe that they had information related to this. And uh, that's where, uh, that's, that's where we're going to go to in the next part. Yeah. John? Yeah. And, and I'm just going to just show real quick here. Okay. This is the uh, a map of the Cambodia Vietnam Eastern border. And in, in, in these areas that uh, on the map here, you'll see where it says like 704, 709, 367, 706. These are base areas that the Vietnamese and the, the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese army and the Viet Cong had as base areas or places where they jump across the border into South Vietnam to wage war on them, you know, with Americans in the South Vietnam, Vietnam forces. And then they'd, they'd sneak back over in the Cambodia area to uh, rest and they had most of their food supplies ammunition stockpiles and things like that were were located in these areas and that's kind of what kicked off this whole thing with the american uh forces uh, doing the incursion into cambodia yeah exactly so if you want to have a look at that that picture again john for a second yep. so um where we're looking at with sean and dana where they went missing is just beside that 354 alley there and that where it crosses over into Tay Ninh. you see that 354 yep that that little dot the dotted line between 354 the vietnam and cambodian border that's where sean and dana went missing so um so now what i'm going to go over is uh, the stuff that the vietnamese guy that they were, they were they were theorizing that there was a Vietnamese man that was a soldier that knew more about what had happened to the guys. So I'm now I'm going to read a report. So there's this man by the name of Ngo Van Rua. He was a very important witness who told the American government back in the 90s this information that he believed to be true and that uh, sometimes he said that he was a witness to this. Firstly, No Van Rua had said that he had participated in the execution, and then after that, he retracted his statement. But I think he probably he retracted his statement after the uh, human rights trials began in Cambodia with genocide. But who knows? He could have been a witness, or he could have participated. So I'm just going to go over what he had to say. So, Mr. Rua entered military service in 1959. In 1964, he began working in logistics with the Benkau District Forces and continued working logistics until 1975, the capture of two Americans. On the morning of an unrecalled date in 1973, Khmer troops captured two Americans, two Caucasian Americans, at the Bulmay three-way intersection in Sphay Ring, province Cambodia. The Americans were riding Honda 90cc motorcycles when they were captured. One motorcycle was red and one was blue. The Americans had photography equipment and wore civilian normal attire consisting of green clothes. The Americans had medium length light colored hair. Mr. Rua indicated that the Americans hair was similar to the a reddish blonde color. Mr. Rua recalled being able to see a mango tree from the spot where he met a group. Mr. Rua did not witness the capture, which took place approximately half an hour before Mr. Rua arrived on the scene. Mr. Rua knew these three Khmer troops who had captured the Americans. 
So he asked these guys about the capture. The Khmer forces explained to Mr. Rua that they were escorting the captured Americans. The three Khmer troops escorted the two Americans away from the three-way intersection. And Mr. Rua asked them, where, what are you planning? Where are you escorting them to? The Khmer escorts replied, they were going to ex- execute the Americans. Shortly afterwards, Mr. Rua departed the area. All three Khmer escorts are currently deceased. They were killed in the time between 1970 and 1979, the guys that killed Sean and Dana. Anyway, during the afternoon on the same day, Mr. Rua spoke with the three Khmer personnel who stated they had executed and buried two Americans in the area. Mr. Rua did not know how they executed the Americans as he did not witness the Americans' death. He only heard about the deaths from the Khmer escorts. During a later excursion through the area on that same day, Mr. Rua observed two mounds of fresh dirt and believed them to be the graves of two Americans, the Khmer escorts executed. Mr. Rua uh, one, uh, then led the US team out there into that area to have a look. This is uh, this document's referring to what was happening in uh, him, Mr. Rua, as a witness to the US. But uh, Mr. Rua was procuring food food stuff and other supplies for revolutionary forces when he happened upon this event. Mr. Rua was the only Vietnamese military troop on the scene. He reiterated that he did not witness the capture, death, or burial of the Americans. As far as Mr. Rua knew, the Khmer forces only seized photographic equipment from the two Americans. Mr. Rua did not know if they seized papers, identification, media, or anything else from the two Americans. Uh, Mr. Rua observed the faces of both Americans. His closest point of approach to the two Americans was four to five meters away. Mr. Rua was able to identify the Americans from was unable to identify the Americans from the photographs shown to him by the American investigators at the time that they were speaking to him. But um, he said that the two captured Americans are the only Americans that he had saw during the, the war time. Yeah. So. Yeah. And he was, he was fairly accurate with the last thing that, that Sean and Dana were wearing. What wasn't he? Exactly. Yeah. That That's the thing. That's the strange thing about it because it seems to be, the information seems to be spot on. Yeah. I know you can't, you know, the last known picture of Sean, I could, you could tell he was wearing what looked like shorts. Um, Yeah, exactly. And they had talked about having rolled up pants or something is what they were talking about with the green shirt. I was going to share this real quick. This, uh, uh, this last footage of Sean that was, that was actually videoed just to kind of show what he's wearing from the waist down, but it does show what he's wearing from the waist up. No worries. Just a sec here. Le reporter Chan Flynn, qui nous a rejoint à vélo moteur, nous signalait les mouvements de troupes Viet Cong dans notre dos. Ultime tentative pour se rapprocher davantage de la voiture et avoir de plus amples informations sur le sort des passagers. Mais une quinzaine d'hommes courbés en deux, courant dans les taillis pour prendre position, nous ont obligés à se précipiter. Okay, yeah, let's watch that one more time, John, please. Is that okay? I, I closed it out. I okay, it's all good. No, yeah, so yeah, that, but you're right. Yeah, that's great. Um, so that's where Sean That's where Sean went missing at that roadblock. It's no worries. Uh, so let me see. So um, uh, on the 18th of March, 1970, many delegations and reporters arrived in Phnom Penh. In April 1970, a group of five or six civilian reporters, including American, Canadian, Japanese, uh, and an Austrian journalist were captured by Khmer forces near the intersection in Takil province. The journalists were carrying a lot of equipment. So uh, we were reading about those journalists yesterday. John? Yep, I'm here. I'm sorry, I put my mic on mute. Those journalists were recovered back in... uh, the early 1990s there was an operation that recovered their remains the guys that were killed in Takeo province yep uh wells hangen the 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 um journalist who you sent me some documentation on yeah it was related to them so at that time in cambodia at this 
around the same time that Sean was captured, other journalists had been captured and they were violently murdered. So um, it seems that whatever happened to Sean, it was they did it away from like uh, away from witnesses. Yeah. Unlike, sp- yeah. Speaking of the witnesses, didn't that didn't the the, the, the U.S. DIA analyst kind of really try to discredit what what was his name Rue or whatever the the, the one you were yes, just I, talking about? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but um, she, yeah, the, I believe the analyst was trying to say that uh, you know he went since he backpedaled in his in his statement about being witnessing the execution and and that uh, he had mistaken. She thinks, or I don't know if it was she, but the analyst thought that, well, maybe that he was just trying to pass off uh, hearsay information as firsthand witness information, and and so that analyst just kind of, kind of just swept it all, swept it all away. But yeah. I think I think it's just like what you were saying when when uh, they started holding the, the 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 trials there for the genocide and stuff that happened. He got kind of got cold feet about the whole deal and retracted his statement. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's there's some other there's some other eyewitnesses that say something very similar to uh, to this though. So I'm I'm just going to go over that quickly. So um, circumstances of loss on the sixth of April, nineteen seventy two. American photojournalists were traveling on two. Honda motorcycles from Phnom Penh to the Cambodian Vietnamese border area to cover US Vietnamese cross border operations in the area. They were reportedly captured by communist forces 10 kilometers east of Chipu in Sve Ring. So, in, this is um, uh, now, so we're going to have a look at these witness statements. Um, okay, so. Both witnesses received their information from Mr. Ock Lee, who was over 50 years old and works with an unnamed Vietnamese man. Mr. Lee was born in Pum Pre Skia, Trak Mot, uh, Motres Commune, Sve Thiep, Sve Ring Province, Cambodia. Mr. Ning's son called Mr. Ock Lee his older brother. Reportedly, the Vietnamese man was in the PAVN during the war and was stationed in the area of the Vietnamese border in Sve Thiep area. In about April in the early 1970s, he saw two reporters who were captured by the Khmer Rouge. The reporters were on motorcycle near Pum Tlok, Sve Thiep district. The KR Khmer Rouge followed the reporters and captured them at Pum Monorom, Sve Thiep near Pum Tlok. They were then turned over to the Vietnamese Communist Forces commander of the Vietnamese base near Pum Monorom. The Sve Thiep district chief kept the motorcycles. The commander of the base near Pum Monorom killed the taller of the two reporters, and the deputy commander killed the shorter reporter. Mr. Lee, uh, his Vietnamese friend, was present when the Vietnamese when the executions had taken place. The unnamed Vietnamese friend lived on the Vietnamese side of the Cambodian-Vietnam border across from Pum Monorom. The burial location for the reporters was near the Cambodia-Vietnamese border near Pum Monorom, Sve Ring, Sve Thiep province, Cambodia. Uh, yeah, so the reporters were buried in a grove of trees about one kilometer east of the village on the Vietnamese side of the border. Uh, it says... Neither of the sources knew the name of the Vietnamese village. The The bodies were buried east of a PAVN cemetery, approximately 100 metres from a small road that uh, accommodated foot, motorcycle and ox cart traffic. The road ran from the Tlok Pagoda, seven kilometres to the burial location in Vietnam. From the small road, there was a network of trails north to the area of a grove of trees where the reporters are buried. The trees in the grove are small and are called schmack trees. Mr. Lee resided in Siem Reap City, Siem Reap Province. Uh, yeah, so this, this is, these are other eyewitnesses that are coming up with similar information. So um, sometimes the reporting differs on whether it was Vietnamese that were involved or Cambodians, but there's a lot of uh, 
it's him, it's him, it's him, it's him. Like the Vietnamese blaming things on Vietnamese, Cambodians blaming things on, uh, yeah, Cambodians blaming things on Vietnamese and Vietnamese blaming things on Cambodians. There's a lot of that in the reporting. Yeah, well, in, you know, and, and there was a lot of that going on back then, wasn't there? Didn't, didn't the yeah. Cambodian people really hate the Vietnamese for the most part? Yeah, well, the Cambodian um, communists and the Vietnamese communists, they had issues back, even back as far as then. They were technically allied, but they also had issues. And the problem is, is I see it uh, when the reporting's talking about the guys, the civilians helping the um, helping the soldiers capture the guys on the motorcycles by holding the fishing net across the highway. Like, uh, yeah, it's just they uh, they were captured. They were captured out there by these bandits. That's that's a that's a saddest thing about it. They were captured by bandits, and I believe that the Khmer bandits they probably killed Sean and Dana because they didn't want the Vietnamese to know that they'd taken the cameras. <laughs> I think that's probably right. why. Right, right. They just that's, want to there's a good chance there. that that's that's why. So, do you think they made it that far up into Vietnam to be executed and killed, or do you think do you think they were just killed just down the road? I don't know. I think I think they were killed somewhere in this area. I don't know the specific information on exactly where they died, but. Um, these documents, they they paint it. They paint a picture, you know. That's um, so. I I don't believe that Sean and Dana survived for longer than twenty four hours. I can tell you that in in my personal belief, in all the time that I have spent on this case, I believe that Sean was detained, interrogated, and killed. And the reason why he was killed after he was interrogated is because they believed that he was CIA, or they believed that he was a spy. These local thugs that had all of a sudden become the police in that area, they were so upset by the fact that Sean and Dana hadn't listened to their directions when they were, when they were going around that roadblock in their territory that they executed them for that within their territory. Everybody knew that the Khmer Rouge was strict, but we didn't really find out about that until about five years later on a worldwide scale. But when it comes to... Uh, yeah, out there in that area. I think a lot of the stuff that happened out in that area was kind of hushed up at that time and there was bombing raids going on. So a lot of the witnesses were, the potential eyewitnesses were dying in that or they were fighting out there as well. So, you know. Yeah, one of the interesting facts that I found digging through the CIA files <clears throat> through their archives was in the presidential briefs that were given to the uh, the president at the time, um, they 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 were talking about there was zero B fifty two bombing campaigns in the camp in Cambodia. Uh, it was it wasn't until it wasn't until like a week or two after Sean and Dana were captured that those B B fifty two strikes, <clears throat> according to these presidential briefs, were happening. Well, I went back and was digging through some more NSA files and different things like that, and I actually found where uh, that wasn't true. That those, these bombings were bombings were uh, with B fifty two bombers were taking place almost up to a year before Sean and Dana, Dana were captured. They started in sixty nine uh, bombing in these base areas, and and they were the CIA was actually trying to control the media. They had uh, uh, released documents talking about how they would control the media narrative uh, on on the bombings, saying that they must have been mistakes or. Uh, the bombers must have been off course or, or some darn thing like that. So the bombings were happening. You know, it had me fooled there for a while, but uh, after finding a few of these documents here this last week, uh, you know, that's one of the things that the CIA was kind of fibbing about, and I don't even know if the president knew at that time. Yeah, well, sure. just think, so Sean Flynn positioned himself in the middle of that. Sean Flynn went out there with a telephoto lens, was taking photographs of southern Vietnamese and U.S. aircraft that didn't have any markings on it. It didn't have markings on it because it was part of the secret bombing operation, operation menu. So they were hitting targets over there. Sean and Dana are trying to take photos of that, or they're taking photos of that. They're taking photos of communist soldiers. They're going back to the U.S., 
embassy in Phnom Penh and reporting to the U.S. embassy information about the bombing out there. Here, here's photos of these American bombers. What's going on? It's like shit. You should. I probably they put themselves in a very precarious situation. Sean and Dana. Uh, I think they'd made a lot of enemies in Vietnam. They'd made enemies. They were high profile. So there was people in the revolutionary forces in Vietnam that had fought like against Sean probably when he was with the Green Berets or up in Con Tien when they fought the defense up there and Sean was involved in um, an incident where he, where he fired back on some Vietnamese soldiers. I think he probably marked himself... Mm, with many governments by his work. When you have a look at the fact that um, Michael Herr and Sean Flynn and John Steinbeck Jr. together, they started the Dispatches News Network, which um, was the news network that broke the May Lai Massacre story. So Sean had made a lot of enemies and those guys out there, they were vicious and they didn't take their time to do due diligence, I don't believe. And Cambodians, uh, the Cambodian communists were the type that would kill first. So um, I'm just going to read another document quickly, John. Is that okay? Yeah. I, yeah. Well, before you jump into that, I'm going to add too, you know, I got to dig in a little bit into Dana Stone's background too. Um, and I'm, I haven't been able to totally prove things yet other than the fact that Dana did serve uh, with the United States Navy. Uh, prior to all this, and he was involved in the Bay of Pigs uh, deal there with you know, with Cuba. So uh, I don't know if he was actual special operations or you know or a SEAL at that time. Or, you know, I'm kind of kind of digging into that stuff. I don't think he was yet, but um, so Dana did have a a military background as well. And yeah, he 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 had a lot of um combat like. Uh, experience too. Sean and Dana had a lot of combat experience. And uh, yeah, you know, Sean was a famous American movie star that was an anti-communist and he fought the communists. He picked up a gun and fought against them in Contien. So he, at that time, Australian journalists and American journalists had believed that Sean had crossed the line between journalists to, and had become an illegal combatant. So it's my, it's my belief that Everybody at that time, uh, politically uh, at that time, had a reason to see Sean and the, his colleagues uh, for, a politic, for political reasons to be inconvenient. And the fact that they could disappear was convenient for uh, the Khmer communists. It was convenient for the Americans. It was convenient for the vietnamese as well that they went missing it was in the end sean going missing was convenient for all of those parties for political reasons because he was a truth teller and he uh, him and dana were very very fearless and they pursued stories that um, had big payoff but were very dangerous and that's essentially how uh, they went missing and i think that to me it's it could the the whole thing it could have happened just as a random occurrence but it also could have been a a, a kill operation the whole thing when you have a look at it the way that it's all it was all set up that all those guys went missing at that time i think possibly that uh the khmer rouge saw an opportunity to uh, they saw they had their enemy list at the top of the list were capitalist domestic capitalists and foreign capitalists so sean flynn was a very famous foreign capitalist in their eyes so to take him and to kill him and to make everybody have, wonder what happened to him and to make that a mystery and and to do that with another 13 people from around the world that was a political victory for a terrorist organization like the Khmer Rouge right it's I'm gonna it's an early victory for them, Sean Sean going missing or them being able to kill Sean. It's an early victory for their political organization. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna jump off subject here, just well, not totally off subject, but back on to Dana Stone real quick. Um, just to just kind of share a little family story about Dana. Um his brother is John Thomas Stone. Uh 
it, after Sean and Dana went missing, it was a couple years after, I think 73, 74, somewhere in there, uh, Dana's brother uh, joined the United States Army. And uh, I know he was joining to go back so he could try to look for, for Dana. But uh, just as a, a side note here, uh, Master Sergeant Stone uh, served with, uh, got out of the Army and went into the Army National Guard in Vermont. And he last served as a master sergeant, and uh, he was deployed over to Afghanistan in 2006, and he was killed in action over there. So I just wanted to, you know, point that out that, uh, you know, even even Dana's brother went looking for him or tried to. Yeah, um, his brother was a his brother was a great hero, and uh, yeah, it's it's un, it's very unfortunate of what happened to the to these guys. Um, you know, you sent me that document and said uh, that source stated that he observed a burial of an American journalist. The journalist was traveling on a Honda motorcycle when he was challenged to stop, but he refused to obey the order. And then there's that other document I sent you. It said, on April the 18th, 1970, 12 days after Flynn and Stone's capture, a United States intelligence agency monitored a radio message from COSVN, the communist headquarters of southern Vietnam, the uh, Viet Cong High Command, informing Viet Cong subregions that two American correspondents were captured near Chipu's favoring province, Cambodia, and from the experience gained from the capture of these correspondents in Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge are to be used in future capture of correspondents. So do you think, uh, well, I know what you think, but just for the sake of the, the story here or the, or the, you know, the conversation, do you think that was the, the Vietnamese government kicking the stone down the road, blaming, blaming the Cambodians? I think it could be looked at like that, or it could be looked at like this. The local Vietnamese and the local Cambodians, it's not like they had cell phones back there. It's not like you could pick up a phone and do due diligence like you can do now. They had to send all these radio um, transmissions through the Viet Cong High Command and all this type of stuff, radio signals and all this stuff. So it wasn't it wasn't so easy for people to be able to have, for the revolutionary forces out in that area to have called up Saigon or something and said, hey, are these guys, you know, are these guys cool? These guys are being captured out there in the revolutionary area, so their territory. So maybe the Khmer Rouge captured them, handed them over to the Vietnamese. They're interrogated, and either local Vietnamese soldiers out there in the Cambodia or Vietnamese and Cambodian soldiers stationed out there together uh, murdered those guys. And the thing is, is they murdered them as spies, and then I think they realized, oh shit. Uh, yeah. once the people in Saigon had got in contact with them or the, the southern revolutionary forces that were trying to work out what had happened to the Americans that had went missing in the territory and then they checked in with the other guys and they're like, oh yeah, we killed all those guys. Well, then I can see why the Vietnamese would say, well, we don't want to have anything more to do with um, holding foreign prisoners in Cambodian territory because look at what happened. We just took these guys, we killed them and we shouldn't have taken them or killed them. And it's created a huge problem that everyone's just going to have to cover up. So do you think that's why the three journalists were released pond and, and uh, those others later on? Well, or was it they just Anson, a background checked out? Well, Anson, that was it was it Robert Anson, I believe maybe that's Correct. his name. Um, uh, Pham Swan An went out of his way to, he sent a message to the revolutionary forces to tell them not to kill him. And that was like six months after Sean and Dana went missing out there. But yeah, so, you know, they they challenged these guys on the motorbikes. The, the last people to see them, they would tell you that. The American guys, I mean, the French guys that were out there, the French journalists would tell you that Sean and Dana were buzzing these guys. They rolled up around that roadblock four times on the motorbike before they were captured. So they were from the these guys, these crazy um, like local security commie guys, Cambodian guys out there who were essentially bandits. And uh, 
to to them those guys were screwing with them so so right. yeah um, i'm just i'm going to read something just quickly it's another yeah. document related to the same type of information so it's related to a 78 year old cambodian nationals um, statement lifelong resident of Tip district Sveiring province cambodia who acquired this information firsthand so sighting of two caucasians under khmer communist control near Tolok commune Svetip, Svetip, Kambuchia. Um, so the source saw two caucasian men captured on national route one Svetip district Svetip province cambodia the two men were under khmer communist control while visiting a relative in Prepadal village, Chak Motres, Commune, Sfeitip, Sfeiting, Kampuchea, the source saw two Caucasian men under the guard of two Khmer communist soldiers. Source saw the group of about um, 20 meters away. So they said that um, the witness said. They saw the group as they moved north from National Route 1 along the road to Tulok Village. This is after Sean and Dana were captured. Yeah. Svetia Province District, same yeah, same area. So both Caucasian men wore, um, it says, light blue shorts, dark trousers. Both had medium-length brown hair, light-colored eyes. The two men were not wearing wa watches, rings, hats, or glasses at the time. The two men had their hands tied behind their backs, but they were walking at a normal pace and did not appear to be wounded. Um, yeah, so they were unable to give exact uh, time of when it happened, the local Cambodians, but said um, the source saw the Americans. The source was sure that the incident occurred in the early 1970s, that the two men were under initially under Khmer communist control. So, uh, yeah. And uh, it said that uh, there's other reporting on foreigners captured on National Route 1 in the area of Prevedal. <laughs> there's, uh, there was a capture of an automobile on National Route 1 and then followed by that capture of that automobile, there was a capture of um, Sean and Dana. And, uh, yeah, there was many, so there was many people lost. So that video clip that I played here a little while ago, whose car was that? That was blocking the road there. That was a, from the so, previous day, right? Yeah. So the previous day, two cars went missing. One, uh, I, I believe they're both Peugeots. One was white. One was gray. Well, maybe it was a Citroen and a Peugeot. But um, the uh, Gilles Caron, the famous French photojournalist, and his friend uh, Guy Haneto from... Uh, I believe he was Swiss. They went, they went out in that area in one car, and there was another group of journalists with them. Uh, a guy by the name of Claude Pont Arpin, who was a French, uh, a French guy from Saigon who'd lived in Saigon for many years, and he had two Japanese journalists with him. So those two groups, of, uh, two groups of journalists had went missing together out of that that area, but one of the vehicles had been shot up and left out on the highway and in some of the reporting it said that when they were when the communists shot up the vehicle that they killed a nearby water buffalo with uh uh like that's fire. Right. so yeah that's right yeah. about that yeah so um yeah so when when i'm start when i'm looking at the the facts uh it it appears that the way that Sean and Dana died, it is not how people have figured it for a long time. What do you think, John? Oh, I think you're on the right trail. Um, what do I mean? What, what, what are your exact thoughts? I mean, I, to me, it sounds like to me with all, even with all this reporting, it sounds like that, you know, I, I still have a gut feeling that maybe they were, like you were saying within the first 12 hours yeah so um so that there's that there's a document which kind of wraps it up that you were you were speaking to uh, before about the credibility of um the information oh, so right. it says that um so a 53 year old farmer from Svay Tiep district Svay Ring province who acquired the information directly through hearsay reliability has not been established the source interviewed by stony beach in 2002 
in the presence of Cambodian POW MIA officials. The 83-year-old farmer from Poipet Commune's Fay Tiep District's Fay Ring province who acquired the information directly and through hearsay. The source stated that he was previously interviewed by Stony Beach sources and was interviewed in the presence of Cambodian POW uh, officials. Okay, so this is a Stony Beach report. Hearsay information regarding the burial of two Caucasians in Monorom Village, Fay Ring province. Background, Mr. Ockley, a 53-year-old farmer from Chakmochis Commune, was previously interviewed by Stony Beach in 2002, claimed to be an eyewitness to the capture of two foreigners near Prepadale Village, track Motres Svetip. Um, so uh, Mr. Lee's uncle, Mr. Tomyan, led him to a possible burial site near Monorom Village. Burial site near Monorom Village on the 6th of August 2010, Mr. Ockley and Mr. Tom Yun showed the possible burial site at Monorom Village. And uh, the 50 meter by 30 meter site is located 800 meters to the east of a dirt road. road um, sorry, I'll, I'll say that one more time. The 50 meter by 30 meter site is located 800 meters to the east of a dirt road running north south from National Highway 1 from Svetok Village towards Monorom Village. The pair explained that the site was excavated by JPAC sometime in the early 1990s, sometime following the JPAC excavation. Vietnamese POW MIA recovery teams excavated the same area. Trenches from the excavations could still be seen. No possible remains or other identifying materials were observed. And it says, uh, so Mr. Rua, who the Cambodians called To To Ru, who was the Vietnamese, communist security cadre during the war uh, that furnished the information that I was speaking about earlier had described the same general burial location to Mr. Tom Yun sh shortly after the two foreigners were captured after the war. So um, Tutaru refused to pinpoint the precise burial location unless he received $3,000 in compensation. Mr. Rua passed away in 2006. They said that... Uh, the, the official stated that um, they brought Mr. Totaru to the area in the mid-90s, but he was unable to point out the exact burial location. So, um, makes you Mr. Wonder Rua... What was, makes you wonder Mr. what he was asking for tell. then. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> makes you wonder what he was wanting for it back then too. Yeah, so... Um, so, I don't, I don't know the exact information on uh, the exact location but you know it seems that the area that they were killed in it's it was called like i read it many times before but they they didn't leave that area this area is essentially if you go off the road from where they were captured that area is called um where is it Svetip. uh yeah, Svetip in, in Cambodia, in Monorum, Monorum village in Svetip, which is uh, near Tolok. Tolok, there's a, a large pagoda, and during the time that the journalists were captured, apparently the Vietnamese and the Cambodians interrogated some of these journalists at the pagoda there. But so what I believe, Sean and Dana, they never left uh, Svay Ring province they died out there either on the Cambodian side of the border or the Vietnamese side of the border and it happened within possibly maybe 24 hours possibly I don't even think it would have been 48 hours I think it happened too quickly for them to be able to communicate with the higher commander or higher higher ranking commanders to be able to work out what to do with them they just killed them and took their stuff and also it was Cambodian New Year the next year. And uh, in my experience living in Cambodia, there's a lot of crazy crime before Cambodian New Year and a lot of theft because people want to have money to return home to their village for New Year. So I think probably the Sean, Sean and Dana had a lot of expensive equipment on them and so did the journalists. And probably the reason why the, the decision was made by the... Cambodian communists and possibly the Vietnamese guys out there to um, take the lives of those journalists was because their their personal belongings were valuable. That's probably why. 
they didn't make it out of there alive. It was more wow. booty in yeah, an area just, where it was just... like, yeah, no gloves. It's gloves off area. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wonder how everyone's going out there, John. They're still hanging in there. Yeah, there's, it's being qu pretty quiet in there now. So, okay, cool. No worries. Yeah, they so, can always catch the back play or, or listen to the upload when I upload the audio. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, I just wanted, I just wanted to, uh, to, to um, go over all that with you. But yeah, so um, yeah, I believe they were killed because of. Um, because they were believed to be spies and yeah and that and that's the and and the people that killed them they didn't know that they were famous and then they killed them before they found out they were famous and then they found out they were famous and then they all worked out well shit we've all just got to lie about this and cover it up and pretend like this we move them somewhere else because we don't you know this is this is not going to look good yeah and you know those those if it was the the cambodians that actually captured them like like what you're thinking um hauled them off wherever killed them within 12 24 hours after their capture um and you know i don't know how many of the guys were at that roadblock that day that captured them but the guys that hauled them off and did whatever they did with sean and dana hell they could they could have died later on in the war you know and so nobody might never know where where uh sean and dana were executed yeah, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's a secret. And also I think, um, I think the U S government understands exactly where, um, my mind's at on this too. I don't know the specifics of the area where they'll kill, but they'll killed out there somewhere and they'll killed there on April the 6th, maybe April the 7th or something. But, uh, and then I think it probably took some time for the, everybody to ascertain exactly what had happened to them because, the small group of guys that captured and killed them probably weren't easy to get a hold of to communicate with. Yeah. You know, my gut feeling was telling me, you know, when I was first started really looking into this case and really researching into it, um, there was quite a few reports that they were actually ca captured by the Viet Cong. Uh, Viet Cong had a camp there just south of, I think it was just south of the roadblock there in the, in the tree line. And there was... That's Some correct. Wit yeah, witness statements saying that uh, that that they were captured by Viet Cong, um, and uh, the Viet Cong and the NVA knew the United States was getting ready to kick off this huge operation into Cambodia within the next few weeks. And so my first thought was, well, they probably moved them up to the Cosvin, the, the COV SN headquarters, um, up there in what do you call that, Mimot? Yeah, Mimot. Yeah, Mimot. I figured they'd moved them up into that area, but then I got to looking into that, and it was a week or two before the U.S. kicked off the incursion that uh, the Cosman had actually moved that that huge base area uh, kind of to the northwest up around uh, Karachi, just yeah. kind of south of Karachi. Yeah. And so I was thinking, well, you know, what they probably what probably happy happened to them is when they were captured they were moved over, up there to my Mimont to be interrogated by the high command and then uh moved with the high command when they moved their assets uh northwest because they knew the the invasion was getting ready to happen and i know there's been some people looking up around that crotchy area and they come up empty-handed yeah, well, I think the the problem with that area is um you've got to to define who was Viet Cong and who was Khmer Rouge and like even the the Vietnamese that were operating out there they had they were using like Khmer Rouge like not Khmer Rouge but like Khmer locals that were technically Viet Cong they weren't they weren't on the Cambodian side you know so the, and there was a whole bunch of groups of different guys out there at that time if you have a look at the history. Um, the Vietnamese attacked Chipu village, the Cambodians attacked Chipu village around the same time. This is all the, in the time leading up to the, uh, the bombings and the, the actual U S and Southern Vietnamese incursion into Cambodia. It's just in the time leading up to that. So it, it's my, my belief that they were killed because they didn't want to have, they didn't want to be captured. 
the, like they didn't want to have those prisoners out there if when the americans had rolled in if they came in they captured a base a Viet Cong base out there and they had american prisoners especially ones that were high profile as sean then i don't think they would have they would have uh it would have went well for them. They probably just thought we don't want to have prisoners if the Americans come in here and cap capture us. We don't want to be caught with prisoners. So just like take them over there, shoot them, and hide their bodies, and no one will know any different. Yeah, and just could be hard to find if they if they were executed in any of those base areas and buried. You know, I'm pretty sure it was a shallow grave, and with the American, you know, with our uh air force coming in there with the b-52s and just carpet bombing those areas there might not be anything left yeah exactly well and, and i think that um it wouldn't have taken much for them to work out like to ascertain that or to be able to prove from their side their perspective anyway that sean and dana were cia after they captured them like even you know sean's a famous movie star american guy they've got they have all their documents and they've got like all these they were dressed like paramilitary special forces so yeah it just it just i think it was bad timing either the side that took and killed sean did not know who sean was or the side that took sean and killed him they knew exactly who sean was and the other guys that went missing out of that roadblock they all went missing to make sure that sean went missing that's a possibility too i did that yeah that's a good point that's a good point yeah, yeah especially so, if they were held together within the first little bit there that's that's a good point well you know if there's this guy going out there taking photos and his interest and he's working against the interest of the american uh, the american military that's clandestinely doing things in cambodia the vietnamese that are clandestinely doing things in cambodia the cambodian irregulars that are clandestinely doing things in cambodia and he comes out there he's taking photos he's reporting to the u.s embassy and all this stuff who knows what type of back door they ha everybody had back then but if if sean went out there you know any one of those agencies the lon Nol troops could have set him up um the vietnamese could have set him up it could just be a coincidence but as i said like he had upset a lot of people and i believe it was probably it's an common intentional kill operation yeah and it's pretty much common knowledge too that now nowadays that uh uh the military assistance command in vietnam which was kind of the overseer of all special operations and stuff that were going on uh, especially in cambodia and laos uh the north vietnamese army had infiltrators go in or had people spies go in and they were within our own uh military assistance command headquarters as spies yeah yeah exactly so um that that means that who knows how many of the journalists that went missing in cambodia at that time actually were legitimately just working as journalists and were not moonlighting as intelligence operatives who knows how many yeah exactly we're moonlighting and if there's even one right? what's that if there's even one that the cambodians could have proven that there's one of them that was like that then all the others would have been tarred with the same brush and whacked under the suspicion of the same stuff exactly exactly so yeah john so thank you for the podcast today do you you said that we're going to go to a, a commercial and uh at towards the end we're going to oh, do no, no, that's i okay. love that commercial that's so that's so cool but um, that's that'll be a secret for the for the audience at the end but anyway man uh what what are your thoughts about today uh, like to wrap it up in conclusion what do you reckon yeah you know it's things are still way up in the air you know on what really happened um you know and, unless there's an actual witness that comes forward or or you you actually find them uh the well, us government actually finds him yeah exactly um, <laughs> well, i don't know how hard they're trying yeah well you know that's it um i don't know all of the answers on what happened to sean in the end but i know the information that um i believe to be legitimate and it's all uh united states reporting so it's and it's very and um also the the local people out there they say they'll tell you it straight up that those guys didn't make it out there alive that they were captured and killed and that the local santa sock they just killed them and took their stuff that's what they'll tell you they used to just there's a story out on the highway that i heard which was weird we filmed it but there was this lady and she saw us and she said where are you going we said cheapoo and she said 
be careful in Chipu. There used to be this man and he would ask people to come to his house. And when they come to his house, he'd steal their car. He'd steal their motorbike. He'd kill them and make them disappear. And this is like what they were telling. And it's like, well, fuck, this sounds like uh, maybe this relates to the journalists. Whereabouts did it happen? Oh, at that road, he, that, that's a man that used to live near that roadblock. So apparently the guy who, the guy that they're relating, relating to, this guy's name was Ta Chun. And he was the, like the security commander out there at that time. And uh, yeah, he nabbed people and killed them for their stuff. Not just those journalists. They There was incidences where Vietnamese civilians and one incident in that village where a Vietnamese soldier was killed by two Cambodian youths who were technically civilians because they wanted his hand grenade and his AK-47 and they hit his body after they killed him. And then it took years for them to find out what had happened to the Vietnamese soldier in that village. So there's a lot of <laughs> really, really, really dark medieval shit that was going on out in that area at that time. It probably still is too. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, yeah. I, I think just kind of wrapping it up, it's just, yeah, it's, it's up in there unless we find or left somebody comes forward and, and, uh, yeah, it was that's 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 as much as I know about it. And I said, um, I hope that the U.S. government knows much more. That I, I believe they do, and I hope that um, that uh, that the U.S. government finds Sean and Dana, or I hope that maybe they have found them. I don't know. Who knows? Who knows if they found their remains or not? It's a possibility. If they had found them, it would be classified, I believe, anyway. So, but um, I know that they were killed out there in that area, and. Uh, that in my belief, that's what happened to every all the journalists that were captured out there. I, I don't real I doubt that many of those guys, or if any of them, made it out of that area alive. Because if one, if a couple of those guys got whacked in that way, well, I can't see why all of those guys weren't whacked in that way. And if something was rushed and they jumped the gun and they killed a whole bunch of people, then I don't think they just would just have killed two people and then left 10 ones alive, jumped the gun on killing two, especially when in Takeo province, when the other group of journalists were captured, they killed all those guys within like 24 hours. They interrogated and murdered them very violently. So right. I can't see why they would have killed two and then let 10 survive, and then those 10 never showed up. So if those 10 never showed up, there's no evidence of them ever seen after that roadblock then I don't know, it's common sense to assume, but it's an assumption as well. It's common sense to assume that probably all of them were whacked at that place and all of them didn't make it out. And in the past, people have always believed that they were held in captivity for a long time, but that's a mystery still, right? Right, right. Yeah, what there was live sightings supposedly of them for years after their capture. In yeah. Some, some cases. Yeah, a tall white American, every tall white American in Eastern Cambodia that was a prisoner at that time, whether they were Air America or US Air Force or like US military captured in the incursion were referred to as Sean Flynn though. Yeah, yeah. And most of them that they had sighting reports on all said that they're real tall Americans with the, what was it, reddish blonde hair and long? Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so today it was a lot about, it was an American civilian case that I wanted to speak to you about today. Um, next time we have a chat, I'd like to do some, um, speak to you about some of the stuff related again to the, the Japanese, the two Japanese that went missing on bicycles. That's going to be the next piece of information that we have a look at. All right. That sounds good, David. So I appreciate you coming on and we'll, uh, we'll try to do one more or do that one here, what, in a week? Yeah, yeah, guys. So thank you with thank you everybody for bearing with me, and thank you for bearing with me, John. Um, I'm a, I I just do uh, I work doing the night shift as a COVID marshal, and uh, Sunday. So Sunday is the end of my week, and I get to check in with you guys at the end of my week. So if I I seem a little bit sleepy, it's because of the fact that I've just uh, essentially just woken up. But I really like to be able to connect with you, John, and to have this chat with you over in Colorado at this time and to speak about this topic and uh, for you to give me the opportunity to voice my opinion in a, yeah, in a demo democratic way. <laughs> there you go. All right. The thing is, is regardless of what anybody 
thinks Mr. Mike Pompeo said yesterday on the internet on his page that Americans don't like socialism. That's what he said. Anyway, it's just a joke, but he did say that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Anyway, so you see, I got the thin blue line, the thin green line. Respect everybody. And thank you, John, for having me on, sir. So from the okay. sunny coast, this is a DMAC out. <laughs> All right. I'm going to play the outro here and uh, get back on with you for a minute. Cool, man. Thank you. Soars above our land, flags so proudly hail. Be proud of this America. Realize.
Hey, John. Thanks, man. Yeah, no problem, buddy. Yeah, it was cool. Um, I'm sorry if I was going too fast in places and stuff. It's just no, hard to try. 